Hello, my name is David Schmoody. I am excited to be here at JupyterCon this year, even if it is virtual. I'm really looking forward to seeing what people are working on, what sort of ideas are floating around. Uh, I'm a big proponent of computational notebooks myself. I am a computational artist. I am a programmer and I live in Berlin. Now today, what I'm interested in talking about is how we're going to, or how we can leverage immutability to make Jupyter notebooks that are easier to read and run. Now, some of the older people in the audience uh, or watching this at home might recognize the source or the inspiration for my title here. It comes from Dr. Dobbs notebook of, or Dr. Dobbs journal of computer calisthenics and orthodontia. This is a journal that was published by the People's Computer Company. And its first editor, uh, Jim Warren, had a cyber libertarian view of the future where he saw that maybe the computer was a way to disseminate information and information is power, then information and computers were a way to empower individuals. Particularly, he saw these uh, journals as, uh, or sorry, these machines as a way to organize and process information, which is in a way what we're still really grappling with uh, with Jupyter Notebooks. Because Jupyter Notebooks are certainly a way to organize information in a readable format. And I think ideally for a lot of us, they're also an ideal way to process information from top to bottom when people read it. Now, the state of the art in 1977 looked like this. This is Dr. Dobbs. Uh, you can see that it's printed on some kind of inexpensive newspaper print, in part because, of course, it was bootstrapped with not a lot of uh, financing. It also has this peculiar layout where sometimes it is um, portraits, or sorry, landscape, and sometimes it is portrait, sort of depending on what sort of information it is trying to convey, the magazine will switch its format. So I want to get back to Dr. Dobbs at the end of the talk. Uh, we'll lead up to it again. But right now I want to talk about the core problem that I want to solve or want to help solve, which is the problem of hidden state in, in Jupyter Notebooks. It is a common sort of um, irritant or complaint about the format that it's really easy to lose sight of state that say is created in one cell and then executed in another. What I would argue is that it's actually a problem deep, deeply rooted in Python itself that Jupyter Notebooks inherit. And as we explore the problem, we'll see how perhaps uh, overcoming these issues is not so difficult if we choose the right tools. So starting from the beginning, we have to start with assignment itself in Python. Assignment is what's going to create state uh, that's going to be executed, and that's where our problem, that's where the issues lie. Now, in Python, we do assignment with the equal sign, and this is already a little bit uh, overloaded because equals originally meant when we were even before we knew how to program, originally meant uh, these three things. It meant something that was had the uh, qualities of being reflexive transitive and symmetric. If a thing A is equal to B, well then B, for example, must be equal to the thing A, that's equivalency. And so uh, this hidden state problem, I think partially is a conceptual syntactical problem because of course we're munging sort of these ideas of equality and assignment and so now equality actually doesn't look like equality. Equality is a double equals, and assignment is a single equals. Now, in our notebooks, uh, we can manipulate data types like strings uh, in this way where we set or assign the variable A to a string 10. And we can assign variables to other variables using the equal sign. And if we modify <coughs> the uh, one side, one operand of the equal side, 
then we get something that is clearly not equivalent. A is clearly no longer equal to B. And as we might expect, actually, um, we have a situation where the identity of a where it exists in memory is not equal to the identity uh, where it exists in memory for B. A quick side note on this environment I'm working in. Most of this talk will be done in NextJournal, where I'll be running cells in this uh, notebook environment, which is Jupyter compatible. It adds a couple nice wrinkles to the game where it is automatically version controlled, so it's immutable from the get-go. And of course, and also when you share notebooks, they become they come bundled with their execution environment, which is really nice. And those execution environments themselves are also immutable, which is great if you share an environment and a notebook and someone changes the environment, it won't necessarily change the original. Now, back to Python. See, uh, these are immutable data types, strings, um, tuples, and bytes. So immutable data types do exist in Python, but problematically, so do mutable data types like lists. So running this cell, I'm setting A equal to a list that contains a string 10. And then I set B to A, I assign that. And this does have the qualities of equivalency that we're used to, where I change A on one side, I did, I did not update B, and B is changed on the other side. So these are actually indeed um, a balanced operation and indeed equivalent. They are actually even in the same part of memory. So Python has several mutable data types and lists are just one of them. And so are byte arrays. So um, this syntax then is changing the state as we move as we, as we go along and it looks kind of like a quality. It kind of doesn't behave like a quality, but sometimes it does. And a computer scientist, uh, Niklas Wirt, did actually make a case for a different kind of assignment operator, the colon equals. He felt like that this equality assignment operator, um, this equality assignment operator, which dates all the way back to Fortran, um, was a giant mistake. He thought, he basically argued that it overthrew a centuries, a century old tradition that let equals the sign denotate a comparison for equality. Uh, the way that we have it now, of course, the left operand, um, which is a variable, and the right operand, which is an expression, of course, are not made really to be equal. So in Python, x equals y does not mean the same thing as y equals x. I really like the colon equals um, assignment operator that it's championed. Uh, here it is in uh, ADA 95, and we can see that we have A and B, which are initiated as integers, set to zero, and then we have a test for equality if A equals zero a little bit later. So I kind of like this because it helps us reason about state. And so if I read the first uh, line here, um, I say uh, set A equals to 42 or A equals 42. That's just naturally what I would say, right? Um, but the problem is if it really was equality, then if one side of the equation changes uh, the state, then the other side of the equation must change its state, right? But that's just not actually how it's working, right? And so uh, what's more precise is, of course, A is assigned the value of 42. Um, because 42 is immutable, it's always going to be 42. It never changes from 42. And if A does change and is assigned to something different, well, then 42 is garbage collected or whatever whatever happens under the hood when that um, A assignment is changed. So there is one other way to think about this too that's quite popular, and it's an enclosure has um, has a way to think about assignment, and that's through define. And here we have um, a, a question or a setting. So we're going to define C. We're going to assign C. Uh, but notice that there's nothing that it's actually being assigned to because it's not assignment. See, assignment is actually the relationship or the correspondence or the correlation between different entities. 
Whereas definition is about getting to the essential qualities of the thing. And so C doesn't actually have to be assigned anything, right? Because it's, it's not an assignment. In fact, if I take a look at C and what it is, uh, C is actually nil. Okay. So it's nothing. It's nothingness is actually its most salient property, right? So that's how it works in closure and enclosure, the define character, the define function, uh, or macro, the def macro works, uh, just the same as we might think of assignment in Python, a equals define a as 10. And then we have this define B as a, and when we mutate a, then there are actually two different things. And to be clear in closure, I'm actually not mutating A. It's actually a whole new property, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. The problem, the, the point is, is it, is it looks quite a bit like uh, Python, like what we expect here. So, so um, the thing about uh, the way we think about assignment is that it also is, um, it matters when and where things are defined. So basically it matters where the scope of the definition happens. And so this is where referential transparency comes in and where that can be very valuable. And so in this first example here, any seasoned Python programmer is gonna know that this is, um, this is not very good code. In fact, I have a global state here of X set equal to one. And then when I run the function inc, uh, I'm going to update this global state. And when I compare the functions, of course, they're not the same. They're not equivalent because I run the function once, I run the function twice, and each time, of course, it's updating this X. So the results of the function are different. This is very poor um, programming style. And for beginners, it's just something that they have to learn that they shouldn't be doing. This is a little better where I have uh, a global state Y and I have the ink function again. And the ink function is modifying Y, but not the global Y. It's a local, a locally scoped Y. So I'm defining it within a different context. Within this new context, when I uh, test for equivalency between the two ink statements, aha, uh -huh, it is true as we expect. But really, that's kind of hard to reason through. And actually, the best one, best way to go about this is probably to define something that is unique in name as well. You know, Jupyter notebooks are really written for human beings to read and only incidentally for computers to execute. So we should pick good variable names, of course, and we should pick distinct variable names. And here we have uh, something that isn't globally defined at all. So it's very clear that when I run these two functions and I pass in a literal, um, they're referentially transparent, meaning that the function and uh, the value that it returns are essentially, you can replace one with the other. And of course, their inc one is always going to be equal to inc one in this case. And the problem really uh, stems here from the fact that this whole business can seem very innocuous. And so we have an, I have a, an anonymous function here uh, that is just a, a simple one plus one equals two. And I have another anonymous function, which is seemingly very innocuous. One plus y equals seven. Wait, where did that y come from? Oh, it came from up here. Okay. Oh, this particular cell is difficult to read because this y is different than this y. And I'm actually referencing this y in this cell down here. This is... This is very um, difficult to reason through, right? So we have to really think about how we use scope. And the way that we use scope, for example, in closure is uh, we have these parentheses around a locally defined variable through a let binding. And the interesting thing about the let binding is it has no global uh, namespace. It has no, is never created in the, in the global context. It really is just in this closure spelled differently, C-L-O-U-S-C-L-S-O-U-R-E. And so it's really defined just within these two parentheses. Now I do have a globally scoped A, if you remember, all the way back here um, in a different section. 
And so again, it's quite difficult to reason about where this A came from. And so this cell and this function, sorry, this cell and this let binding is carrying all its context with it. And these closures are kind of nice because they syntactically kind of wrap everything um, neatly into one bundle and um, are only as good for as long as that function is living. And I think this sort of encapsulation is, is a great inspiration for what, how we can think about cells in Jupyter Notebooks. If we can keep cells, of course, really um, ideally encapsulated and pure with very few side effects, our notebooks will be much easier to read. This uh, next cell is just an example of how the scope works within Clojure, where I have um, this I, which has never been created globally. And if I actually try to reference some sort of global definition of it, it's going to give me an error message. When in fact, um, the only I that I can reference is within the let binding itself. So those are some of the ideas that underpin um, the problem at hand. But what I'm really interested in is how this can be applied practically. And one of the places where this is immediately apparent is in, um, is in Pandas. Pandas actually makes an explicit statement about immutability in its documentation. So how it handles state. And in general, they say we favor immutability where sensible. So the question is, what is sensible? So I'm going to bring in this data set of artists that are in the collection at the Tate, the Tate Gallery in um, the United Kingdom. And this is a set of, this is global state that I've created. And Python try, or Pandas tries to help you here because they're not going to make it easy uh, to manipulate this state because of all these trappings. So if I print sort, if I print the column headings of this table, I have ID and ascension number and artist and artist role and artist ID. Okay. If I drop one of those columns and then print the headings again, I actually get the same set of values even though I dropped the columns. That's because it's immutable. Now, pandas uh, data frames can be mutated upon explicitly if I use this in place equals true um, parameter. So in this case, I print the column names again. We see them here. I drop a column name and then I print them again. We see them here. Now the problem quickly presents itself. If I run this twice, well, now I this cell no longer works because I've actually already dropped the column that I'm trying to drop. So this is a problem with immutability, with mutability, but I would argue that this is not even a very big problem. It's a it's a kind of an easy problem to catch compared to what we're going to look look at. I think what's more innocuous and more difficult to find is if we actually mutate or change data within a data set. So here we have uh, the data set, the, the, the table with all the uh, headers and then all the data. And here's the acquisition year. And I'm going to mutate this or look at this acquisition year uh, for the first piece of art in the table. And if I do that, the acquisition year of this Robert Blake painting is 1922. I can increment that number pretty easily with this pure function. And of course, it's a pure function, so it's always going to be the same. However, um, I can actually mutate this. <clears throat> so if I have this uh, function where I increment the value in that cell and I test whether or not it is greater than or equal to 1922, sorry, less than or equal to 1922, it's going to be true. Um, 
then if I mutate the, the value and try it again, well then 1924 is not greater than or equal to 1922. So the first time I did not mutate it, I did the test. And then I did mutate it and I did the test. Okay, so this same piece of code is gonna give us different outcomes depending on where we run it, which is not so much a problem necessarily until you run it across a lot of data, until you are taking individual values in a table and, and looking at them and poking them and changing them. And it becomes quickly just as difficult to wrap your head around and to actually ascertain what is happening as uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So we want to avoid this as much as possible where we're mutating values within a table. And a way that I might recommend doing that is instead of working with a technology that says some immutability is, is preferred, you might consider a, a different tech or a different library that actually guarantees immutability throughout the entire process. So in this case, I'm looking at static frame, which is very similar to pandas. It has some syntactical difference, but adapting it, adapting to it is not very hard if you're familiar with pandas. And so I'm going to take this exact same, exact same table I've been working with. I'm going to then actually take a look at uh, the same sort of transaction I did before. And even if I increase, again, the acquisition year, um, this, no matter where it happens in my code, this test to see if something is less than or equal to 1922 is always going to be true, regardless of where it happens in the notebook. Now that might seem really limited or limiting to a programmer, but in fact, I would argue that there's a lot of power here it puts the burden on us to really think about to really think about what mutating data really means because we can essentially mutate it if we give it a new name so in this case this code is very similar to the code above it the only difference is i'm creating a new data frame with a new name that is pointing to the mutated data set so if something changes its essential qualities, is it the same thing? If not, then what is the name we could give the new thing? I don't know if DF updated is a very good name, but for the purposes of our demonstration, I think it's a fine name. So I update the, um, I, I, sorry, update the data frame, not in place, but I actually, increment a value in that data frame and the return value of that gets assigned to df updated. That didn't change the original df. df itself remains the same, but the return value of df update, df assign, now that has changed and that is what's going to be assigned to df updated. So we give something a new name when we mutate its qualities. Now, back to Dr. Dobbs. So, Dr. Dobbs, um, when they when they shared information, they they shared it in a format that looks kind of like this. Now, this is still actually, I would argue, pretty readable code. And so, this code, um, I'll bring it full screen here. This code uh, is actually an implementation of a for loop. So you would type this code in, and in this code, uh, you would uh, once you execute it, you would get a higher level function for loop that you could iterate over a data structure. And um, I would, the, the, it has a lot of uh, literate programming sort of attributes. It has a strong 
uh, opening is heavily commented. And so even today, I can, without knowing the assembler code very well or at all, I can get some kind of sense about what's happening as we're poking stuff in memory and replacing stuff and putting stuff back in memory, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I would argue that programming today hasn't actually changed much since it has, uh, since it was in the 1970s. Now, back then, of course, you had to type in programs, but now if you are getting stuck or you're trying to learn or something's not working, you go to Stack Overflow and cut and paste program programs. What we really want are programs that come with their context and that can run. Instead of cutting and pasting or typing in, uh, we want runnable software that can be run sort of in, um, in, in any point in the future. So in order to get that, we need, sort of, we need immutable contexts. We need cells that are referentially transparent. And we need to make sure that um, cells that have side effects are very clearly, uh, very clearly and carefully attributed as such. And that's one of the powers of these notebooks is the fact that you can actually give some kind of context to when you are actually mutating uh, some kind of warning to when you're actually mutating values. So we'll default to mutability wherever we can, especially globally. Um, the syntax that we're going to use, um, I think is more powerful if we are using imperative constructs like what we see in pandas and like what we see uh, in static frame, rather than declarative context like the for loops from that Dr. Dobbs. And finally, we should publish all of this stuff together uh, with, our comp with our environments, with our data, so these notebooks can be run. Okay, well, thanks a lot for your time today. It is a pleasure to talk about this stuff. Uh, please feel free to contact me at any of these places uh, to chat more about computational notebooks. Be a lot of fun. Okay, ciao.